But today we're here in chapter 18, and we're looking at, at um, the entire chapter tonight. So let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 18 at verse 1. We'll read verses 1 through 3, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel? saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. What we're going to be seeing in chapter 18 as we go through this chapter tonight in the book of Ezekiel is simply this. Ezekiel is dealing with the subject of a person's individual responsibility before God. And what he's doing here in this chapter is emphasizing a judgment, judgment that is coming on the people. And these people are being judged are the ones who are alive, and you're going to see this in just a moment. God is going to bring judgment, but he's allowing them or letting them know, rather, uh, how just he is in bringing judgment. We'll be looking at that in this chapter. You see, up to this point, various times we've seen Ezekiel speak concerning national responsibility. The nation of Israel has sinned. The nation of Israel is being judged. In this chapter, we see personal responsibility. And so what he does is he begins by asking concerning a popular proverb that has been circulating amongst the people. That proverb is uh, verse 2, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, they're complaining. They're complaining that they're being punished for something they didn't do. You know, the fathers are the ones who ate the sour grapes. Why are we the ones who are paying the penalty is what you're seeing there. You see, these people who are saying this believe that their exile in Babylon is unfair because it was their parents who sinned and not them. And so they're wondering why they're having to pay a penalty that they're really not guilty of. What this really reflects, and this is why, why God makes a statement in verse 3, as I live, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel, what actually is taking place and what God is going to make clear is that uh, they aren't being treated in an unfair fashion. The problem is, is they don't see their own sin. And God is saying, you're being punished. You're being punished for what you've done. You're being punished for what you have done, and you are not being punished for what your fathers have done. And so your self-assessment is not correct because you have personal guilt. And the fact that you think that you're being punished for something that you didn't do shows that you don't understand what you have done. You see, you are in exile because of idolatry, and you're reaping the consequences, and that, what, that is what we're going to be seeing here. That's what he's, he's saying when he says, you are to no longer use this proverb in Israel. In other words, he's rejecting their shifting of the blame, and he's telling them that they're reaping the consequences of their own sin. So he's saying, in essence, stop blaming me for what, you're, what you've done. Stop blaming me because you have done this to yourself. People have a tendency, we know this, of blaming God for things they got themselves into. Somebody decides to drink. They drink to excess. They climb in their car. They drive down the street. They get into an accident. And then they begin to say, why, God, did you do this to me? I see that all the time. They've done something they ought not to have done, and when they reap the consequences, the first thing they say is, God is unfair. God doesn't love me. And they begin to blame God. People do that all the time. They make unwise choices. They reap the consequences for those choices, and then it's God's fault. God is the one who did this to me, and that's what's happening here. These people are paying the price for their own sin. They simply don't understand that. And that's why he's saying, listen, you are responsible for your own sin. Notice verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. So God makes it clear that every human being belongs to him. All souls are mine. That would include those who are, are righteous, living for him, and, and even those who do not live for him. Every human being ultimately belongs to him and is accountable to him. And that's why 
when ultimately judgment comes, God is going to be able to judge fairly because he knows the ins and outs of every individual's life, and therefore he will deal with them in a, in a fair way. And so because God is fair, he's basically saying here, seeing that I own you, that you belong to me one way or another, you need to understand that you have personal responsibility for your own life that ultimately you're going to be given an account of. All souls belong to me. Now, when he says all souls, that word soul is a Hebrew word, nefesh. It's a word that can be translated by various English words because it has various contextual meanings. The word soul can speak of a person's life. It can speak of a person themselves. You know, five souls were saved speaks of an individual. It can speak of a person's mind or their heart. It, it can speak of an appetite, a desire, even an emotion. It depends on the context. Here in this particular passage, when God says, all souls are mine, it's making reference to a person's physical life. And he's saying, the person who sins is physically going to die. That's what the New Testament says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. In the New Testament, Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So a person who's living in sin ultimately dies. And there are really two aspects to, to, of, to their death. One is physical death comes upon all people, but secondly, the second death, which speaks of eternal judgment, comes upon those who don't have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. All souls belong to Him, regardless of whether the person is saved or not. But some people enter into the kingdom of God because of faith in Him, and another person is rejecting the things of God and thus doesn't enter into his kingdom, but every human being ultimately will be held accountable. The New Testament book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 12, makes that very clear. Each of us shall give account of himself to God. Or Hebrews, in chapter 4, verse 13, there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The apostle Peter, in 1 Peter, chapter 4, verse 5, says, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. All souls belong to God, he is saying. All souls are mine, and the soul that sins shall die. Ultimately, we'll reap the consequences of a life that has been lived outside of the will of God. They will die physically, and a person who lives and dies in sin dies and remains in that state, and they will enter into judgment in the second death. But he begins to develop something with us, and I want to show you this here beginning in verse 5. I'll read verses 5 through 9 and give you some information, and we'll look at this in a practical way. He says in verse 5, but if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he has not eaten on the mountains nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife nor approached a woman during her impurity, if he has not oppressed anyone but has restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry and covered the naked with clothing. If he has not exacted usury nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true judgment between man and man. If he's walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. Now, this is interesting to me, and I'm going to develop it this way even though I'm getting ahead of myself. You'll see this in a moment. Verses 5 through 9 are going to be taken as a whole, then verses 10 through 13, and then I'm going to take you to verses 14 through 17. That's how I'm going to divide this. And I tell you that in advance because I want you to see this with me, and you'll see this as it unfolds. Verses 5 through 9 speaks of a father. Verses 10 through 13 speaks of his son. And verses 14 through 17 speaks of his grandson. What you're seeing here, and it's going to be illustrated this way, is three generations. Three generations of people descending from one man, or including one man. Two generations descending from the one man. The father who has a son, who in turn has a son. Grandfather, son, grandson. That's what we're going to be looking at. And so what we have here is the first one, verses 5 through 9, who is represented as a righteous man. Verses 5 through 9 speaks about Old Testament standards of righteousness. And so as he's being described here, God even refers to him as being just because 
He's given to him an Old Testament standard of righteousness, and he's saying that this man, if he does these things, is a righteous man. Notice he says in verse 5, if a man is just and does what is lawful and right. And so he's speaking about somebody's condition of the heart. He is just, and secondly, that which comes from him in terms of his works. He is first just, he is just, but he also does those things that demonstrate that he has a heart that is right towards God. So he's speaking about the one whose heart and conduct are right before the Lord. The man is just, and the man does what is right. In other words, doing what is right begins with a heart that is just or justified righteous before God. So he's speaking about a man who, according to Old Testament standards, is living a right life before God, a just life. And he begins to speak concerning this man in the habit of his righteousness over a lifetime. He says he has not eaten on the mountain or worshipped idols. When he says he hasn't eaten on the mountains, the mountains were associated as high places during the time of the writing, and that's where people would go for idolatry as well as for what would be called immoral, idolatrous feasts. They'd go there and party and do all kinds of sinful things. This is a man who hasn't done that. He says he's not defiled his neighbor's wife. In other words, this is a man who has, has remained true to his own if he's married. This is a man who has not committed adultery. This is a man who is just in that way. He says he has not approached a woman in her impurity. Uh, that's an interesting phrase. Leviticus 18 verse 19 says, you shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is in her customary impurity. He has not violated God's law related to physical intimacy because according to the law, they were not to have physical intimacy when a woman was having her menstrual cycle. He's saying she honors God's law as it relates to physical relationships. Verse 7, continuing, he has not oppressed anyone. Now, the reason he has not oppressed anyone is because he genuinely cares for other people. He's restored the debt or his pledge. Now, when you read the Old Testament, if I was an individual who was poor and I needed some help, I might give as collateral an article of clothing to the individual that was helping me. But if I gave to him a blanket or my cloak which kept me warm at night, he was to return it to me so that I could use it. So he's saying this is a man who has a good heart towards people. He hasn't robbed anyone by violence. Rather, he's generous and he's concerned for the poor. Once again, in the Old Testament as well as the New, concern for the poor is one of the standards God actually gives to us that demonstrates somebody truly is righteous. If the person actually cares for the genuinely poor, that is a mark of righteousness in Scripture. And James chapter 2, the New Testament book, verses 15 through 17, says it like this. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The Old Testament and New Testament standard of righteousness includes concern for the poor and helping them when they're in need. He says in verse 8, if he has not exacted usury or taken any increase. That's interesting. If we were together in Israel during the time of the writing under the law of Moses, and you as a Jewish individual come to me as a Jewish man and you say, I need some help. Can you lend me some money? I was to lend you money without interest. I could lend money to somebody who wasn't Jewish at an interest rate, but I could not lend money to you at interest. I would give it to you, and you would pay me back exactly what it is that I lent to you. In Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 and 20, this is what the law said. You shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out of interest. To a foreigner you may charge interest, but to your brother you shall not charge interest, that the Lord your God may bless you in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. Now, wouldn't that be beautiful to buy a house without interest today? You know, the first house that we bought, uh, we actually bought uh, over 30 years ago. It would be mine now. We had, uh, it was $500 a month. We were going to pay $500 a month for 360 months. 
going to be about $180,000 for a $47,000 home. And I remember when, when we were buying that house, my dad saying to me, you know, son, one of these days, $500 a month is going to be a bargain. And I looked at my dad and I said, oh, that I, I hope I don't live that long, dad. I did. <laughs> I did. Wouldn't it be nice? Because I figured it out. I thought, you know, I, paid, I would have paid off that house $47,000 at the rate of $500 a month. I'd have paid that house off in no time. But I realized that I was going to pay years and years and years of interest on that house. Well, in the days of Israel, if I went and I borrowed something and they, they lent it to me, they were to give it to me without interest. And the reason is, is because, because we're family. Because we're family. Now, I don't know. I know some people who lend their kids money at interest. I know, I know some who do. I, I don't. I just don't give them anything. No, I, I don't. <laughs> they lend it to me. No, I, um, I, I never have. You know, I, I've never tried to profit off of my children. Um, it's just you, just, you don't profit off of your family. I mean, that's your family. You want to bless them, not take from them. And, and that was the attitude that uh, God wanted to ingrain in the minds of the Jews. So he says, a righteous man is somebody who doesn't take advantage of somebody who's in real need. I mean, look what happens sometimes when people are in need and they go to somebody or they, they have a credit card and that credit card is 18% and if you don't pay on the right moment, then suddenly it's up to 25 or it even goes higher now. Think about that for a minute, how that you're constantly paying on interest and never even touching principal. Well, during this day, God said, no, you're not to take advantage because a person who's borrowing has a need. That person has a genuine need, and you would be hurting them by taking more from them, so you ought not to do that because that's your brother, and you never take interest from a brother. In verse 9, he says, if he's walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he's just and shall surely live. So this is a man who keeps the requirements of God that reveal a heart of obedience and God says, this man is just. He shall surely live. Now, he's going to live not only in the physical sense, but he also has a spiritual life because he's walking properly with God. He's got a genuine faith in God. And God says he's justified before him. It's not all these works. You'll see this in a moment. It's not all his works that he's doing because works do not justify a man before God. People can have all the outer works but still have a heart that is far from him. This is a man who is just and does what is right. So it speaks of his, his righteousness actually beginning from within and being worked out in his life. You never were in Old Testament nor New Testament made right before God by your works. You never were. Paul makes reference to this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11 in the New Testament when he says that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So in the Old Testament, Abraham was, was right before God, just before God, by his faith, and we who have faith like our father Abraham are made right before God. So it isn't works of righteousness that anyone has done that causes us to have a right standing with God but it's God imputing to us or giving to us his own righteousness based on our faith in him that distinguishes us as New Testament believers as being righteous before God. So even in the Old Testament, as this individual is spoken of as doing these things, all these good things that he does originated in a heart that was right with God. And God declares him to be just. So this is a just man that he's speaking about. Now, as he speaks concerning him, he goes into a second generation, verse 10, and this is his son, this just man that God is speaking of. If he begets a son who is a robber or a shedder of blood, who does any of these things and does none of those duties, but has eaten on the mountains, defiled his neighbor's wife, if he has oppressed the poor and needy, robbed by violence, not restored the pledge, lifted his eyes to idols, or committed abomination. If he has exacted usury, taken increase, 
Shall he then live? He shall not live. If he has done any of these abominations, he shall surely die. His blood shall be upon him. Can a godly parent have an ungodly kid? Yeah. Yeah. You see it all through the Bible. God had Adam and Eve, first dysfunctional family in history. And you see it all through the Bible. You see it in the children of Abraham. You see it with the children of David, with Samuel. You see it with Eli and his kids. You see it throughout the Bible. You have righteous parents, a righteous man or a righteous woman, who live in a right way where God blesses tremendously. And they're the heroes. They're the giants of the faith. And they end up with some kids who are legendary in their evil. Is it possible for a righteous man to have an unrighteous son? And the answer, obviously, is yes. It is absolutely possible. It happens all the time. And so, God is actually saying this. He's saying, does a righteous man's personal righteousness extend to his son? In other words, are my sons and my daughters going to be saved because I'm saved? Are they going to be able to get into heaven based on the faith that their father has? Can my kids be guaranteed that they have a relationship with God because their father's a pastor? And the answer, obviously, is no. Because they have to have their own faith. They have to have their own relationship with God. They stand or fall before God on their own merit. So a godly man, somebody who does all the right things, can have ungodly children. And that's the point that God is making. A person is saved by personal faith, not by the faith of someone else. Now this son here did none of the things the father did. As a matter of fact, as we see it, he was ungodly in every way possible. So the question is being asked, should he live because his father is righteous? And the answer is no, because a natural relationship does not profit him. There are people in this church, young people in this church that I have met and that I know, who have been raised in homes that, that the mom and dad served the Lord, loved God, gave them devotions, pray with them. They've been raised in godly homes, but they themselves have rejected the God of their parents. For some reason, whatever it may be, they, they don't want a relationship with God. Raised in a good home, raised with good parents, brought to church from the time they were small, going to church and church camps and being in VBS and you name it, they were part of it. When they turned 18 years old, they didn't want to come to church ever again. And I've seen many kids over the years who at the age of 18 disappeared, and I haven't seen them since. Their parents still come to church. Their parents are still serving the Lord, and every once in a while we'll talk, and I'll ask, how's your kid? He's not doing well. He's out there partying. He's out there doing the drugs. He's doing all those things that we tried to teach him not to do. Is it possible? Yes, Absolutely. Each individual has to have a personal relationship with God. And, and so my kids aren't going to go to heaven based on my faith. My wife can't go to heaven based on my faith. I only have enough faith for myself. I don't have faith for somebody else. In, uh, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 3, John the Baptist is speaking. It's found in verses 8 and 9. And he's speaking to some self-righteous individuals of his day. And as he's speaking to them, he says this to them. He says, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these, uh, these stones. Don't think that you can, through natural descent, have an automatic buy into heaven. Don't think that you're going to go to heaven based on the fact that you are a descendant physically from a man by the name of Abraham. You may have a physical descent, a lineage that is from him, but Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And unless you believe God, John was saying, you won't have a place in heaven. Again, I can't believe on behalf of anybody else. 
My personal testimony doesn't save anybody except myself. My children, my grandchildren, my wife, my parents, none of them got saved based on my testimony. Every one of them got saved based on their own testimony, that God grabbed hold of them. God spoke to them. God convicted them. God drew them. God saved them. I had the responsibility of declaring the things of God to them from the day I got saved from within the first three hours of my salvation. I got saved in the afternoon, climbed into a van, was driven home, dropped off at my house, walked directly across the street, spoke to some friends about the Lord, came back into my house, shared with my sisters. From the very beginning when I got saved, I really honestly believed that people needed the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's why I preached the gospel. That's why I shared. That's why when I was three weeks to four weeks old in the Lord, no older than four weeks in the Lord, that's why I tried to have Bible studies at my house and tried to teach at four weeks old in Jesus. I mean, talk about making a mess of the things of God. I mean, what do I know? Have you ever watched a two-year-old try and feed another two-year-old? Have you ever seen that? Where they grab the food and they try and put it in the face of the other baby? That's what I was doing. And what I would do is I would go to Bible studies just like this. And I was memorizing the things that the teacher was saying. And as I would listen to what he said, I listened to every important point that I could pick up. And then the following, you know, two days later, I had people at the house. I'd open up the Bible to that passage, and I would repeat the things that I had been taught. That's what I did. What did I know? I knew absolutely nothing. Once I was blind, now I can see. That was pretty much it. Once I was lost, now I'm found. So there I am trying to feed other people things that I'm having to learn to consume myself. But there was something there. There was something there that, that, that made me believe, like you, made me believe that whatever I, I have been given is so good it needs to be given to somebody else. It has to be given to somebody else. But I knew from the beginning that, that I had to have a faith in God. I had to be right with God personally. I couldn't believe for my mom. I couldn't believe for my dad. Listen, if I believed that I could save them by my faith, I wouldn't have had to share with them. I wouldn't have had to tell them about God. I'd have just believed for them. But that's not how it works, guys. They had to believe on their own. And I had to love them enough to tell them the truth. I had to love them enough to tell them what I knew. I had to. And they were saved by God. They had their own testimony and have their own testimony. That's how it works. And so, no, I can't believe on behalf of my, my children. I cannot believe on behalf of my wife. I have to believe for myself. And so, a godly man can have an ungodly son a son who doesn't do any of the things that the father did. And so the Lord is saying, shall he live? Shall he live if he's evil? And then he gives the answer, he shall not live. If he's done any of these abominations, he shall surely die, and his blood shall be upon him. In other words, he has personal responsibility for rejecting the light. Verse 14, if, however, he begets a son, here's the grandson, who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers, but does not do likewise, who has not eaten on the mountains, nor lifted his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, has not oppressed anyone, nor withheld a pledge, nor robbed by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry, covered the naked with clothing, who has withdrawn his hand from the poor and not received usury or increase, but has executed my judgments, walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, robbed his brother by violence, and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. So you have a grandfather who's righteous. You have a son who's unrighteous, but now you have a grandson. And the grandson looks at what his father is like and says, I don't want to be anything like that, like a lot of sons do to this day. They look at what their dad's turned out to be, and they say, I don't want to be anything like that. I don't want to be that kind of man. 
And this young man looked at the dad, saw what he was like. He was an unrighteous man, but he looked at his grandfather and he said, that's the kind of man I want to be. I want to be like him. So instead of following the bad example of his father, the grandson followed the example of godliness. He considered the issues and he decided to pursue his grandfather's example. When it talks about him considering this, when it says he considers but does not do likewise, considers he's weighing it through in his mind. He's looking at it and thinking about it. And he's saying, what will it profit me if I become like my father? Do I want to be like that man? Do I want to be the kind of guy that he is, the guy who neglects my mother, a guy who is ungodly? Do I want to be like that? Is this the kind of man that I want to be when I look at him and I see the way that he lives and the disrespect he has towards people, the fact that he doesn't care for the poor, this unrighteous example? Do I want to be like that? No, I don't want to be anything like that. What a challenge it is, by the way, as I look at this for us as fathers, those of us who are fathers, to be the best example we can for our kids so that they look at us as a hero. So they look at us and say, that's the kind of man I want to be. I want to be like that. Because as I live before my own children, as you live before yours, they're looking at you and they're saying, do I want to be like this or do I want to be, want to be different? Well, this one looked at the dad and looked at grandpa and said, I'd rather be like grandpa than be like my father. And so the question that's being asked here is very simply this. Would God judge a godly son for the deeds of an ungodly father? Is that how it works? Is the ungodly father's sins going to be visited on that son? Is the son going to pay the penalty for the things that the father did? And again, the answer is no, because judgment occurs on the basis of each person's life. In John, in chapter 5, Jesus says this, verses 28 through 30, he says, Do not marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. God's judgment is always righteous. And so God is saying, no, I will not judge a godly grandson based on the ungodliness of his father. Well, verse 18, as for his father, he's cruelly oppressed and robbed. The ungodly father is going to reap what he's sown. He reaps the consequences both in this life and in the life to come. He's going to die physically, but he also dies in an eternal sense because he dies in unrepentant sin. And one of the things that we really need to remember and understand is there are no second chances. For many years, I thought you got second chances. I grew up in a system that basically, as I was growing up, taught us that there was a second chance. It took the form of purgatory. How many of you have ever heard the word purgatory? It took the form of purgatory. Purgatory, a place of purging. And so there was a teaching that I received that there were temporal residual effects of sin that needed some time in a place called purgatory for them to be dealt with. And so as I grew up as a, a young boy, I didn't have a hope for eternal life because my only real hope that I had was that perhaps I'd be able to get out of purgatory before too long. And when I grew up and I went to Catholic church and when I grew up and went to catechism, in one of our little books that we used as we went through our classes, there was actually a section where it said the value of prayers and how many days you could actually uh, remove from your sentence if you repeated these prayers, Our Father's, Hail Mary's, various prayers like that. And I can still remember in catechism class not listening to anything that the teacher said for the entire hour as I just kept repeating Hail Mary's and Our Father's, and I actually was keeping score. And I, I, I wiped off a couple years you know, that day. I'm serious, I did. I mean, I actually did. I started counting up how many days and all of that, and I just kept praying for the entire 
time because I was one of these kids who believed what you were telling me. It's got to be true because I'm here in a place that is talking about God. It's got to be true. You can't imagine how surprised I was when I, when I got saved and actually read the Bible. And Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto men to die once and after this the judgment. Once after this the judgment. There are no second chances. You die in the grace of God, you enter into the presence of God. You die outside of the grace of God, you enter into eternity in that state. You stand before God in your own righteousness or you can stand before God in the righteousness of Christ. We have the imputed righteousness of Christ. He gives to us his own righteousness so that when I stand before God, I'm clothed in the righteousness of the Son and therefore God sees me through his Son. And I can enter into the kingdom of God not based on works of righteousness which I have done, but I get into the kingdom of God based on God's mercy towards me. And that's how you enter in. That's the grace of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God that is worked out in salvation, you see. And so this father enters into judgment because he has not regarded the things of God. Now it goes on in verse 19 and says, yet you say, why should the son not bear the guilt of the father? Because the Son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and observed them. He shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself." It sounds like they're arguing with God on this matter, thinking that the son should be punished because of the father. They're thinking that they're being punished because of the things that their fathers had done. And they're basically saying we shouldn't be judged because we've been righteous as a nation. It's our fathers that are guilty, but God is making it clear. No, you're being judged on the basis of your own evil because you have rejected me. You saw that back in Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 2. There it said, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house which has eyes to see but does not see, ears to hear but does not hear. They are a rebellious house. So they're arguing with God about this. And God says, no, no, you are judged based on your own personal accountability before me. Verse 21, but if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? What a powerful, powerful scripture. God does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. This here gives to us a great insight into the goodness of God. God is saying, listen, a person who has turned from his sins and as a result of that hungers for my statutes, for the things that I've declared in my word, a person who has had a change of heart that is consistent over the rest of his life is an individual who truly has a walk with me. He's not talking about simply an outward righteousness. He's talking about an inward change, an inward change that created a brand new life. You see, it's not difficult to have an outward change. It's not hard to have an appearance of righteousness. It really isn't. You know, growing up in the era that I did, born in 1950, growing up in the 60s, when all the hippies were running around all dirty and grungy and everything, when I got saved and I'd want to share with somebody who was, was older, you know, old timers like in their 40s and stuff, when I wanted to share with those old people who could hardly hear anymore, And they'd look at me, and I'm barefoot still. I mean, just because I got saved doesn't mean I have to put shoes on. And I still had the long hair, 
And I still had the funky sideburns and the granny glasses and still had the tie-dyed T-shirts and the whole nine yards. Didn't change my outer appearance. But I discovered something. I discovered something very quickly. I discovered that, that many people who were older than me would not listen to what I had to say because of the way I looked, because of my outer appearance. These same people would listen to somebody, a member of a cult. If you placed me next to a Mormon, they'd have listened to the Mormon because a Mormon kid is so clean because a Mormon kid had a white shirt on and a nice haircut and, and me, I was grungy looking. And I discovered that. I discovered that people have a tendency of looking on the outer appearance. And sometimes we, well, as a matter of fact, that is, that is generally true today. Somebody wears a certain kind of religious garb and immediately they believe him to be a spiritual person because spiritual people wear spiritual clothing. I was at a restaurant years ago with a friend of mine. We were having a meeting there. And we went there every Monday to have coffee and meetings. It's one of my staff members. And the waitress got to know us because we always sat in the same place. And before you know it, she started being real friendly with us and she'd walk up, hi guys, how are you? You know, she got to know us. We'd been there for several weeks in a row. Oh, we're fine, thank you. And she'd give us our coffee and, and you want any breakfast? No, we're just here for some coffee, just, just talking, okay. Every week she would come and every week she got friendlier with us until one day she walks up to me and my friend and she says, I want to tell you a joke. And I, we smile, and she tells an off-color joke. And I just kind of politely look at her, and I, I, you know, what do you do? You know, stand up, thou foul spirit. No, I just looked at her. I, <laughs> harlot. No, I, I just, I, I, I just smiled at her and didn't, didn't respond, you know, and so she, she thinks, oh, she goes, oh, it wasn't that funny, huh? And I just smiled. She goes, oh, she walks away, comes back. Oh, by the way, what do you guys do for a living? So I smiled at her. I said, I'm a pastor. And she looks at me, and she goes, what? And I go, I'm a pastor. You're, what? And she looks at me, where's your uniform? Where's your uniform? And she turns to her fellow waitress and she says, I just told a pastor a dirty joke. I feel terrible. <laughs> but she said, where's your uniform, man? Like, yeah, I got to wear a little name badge. Pastor David here, you know. <laughs> but that's how people are. I mean, they, they expect you to have a certain outer garment that they can say, this is a righteous person. But in reality, righteousness is... is, is in the heart. It's, it's a matter of the heart. It's not the outward at all. During the time of Christ, and there were some people, we all know them by the name of the Pharisees, the separated ones, and they had an outward appearance that was hard to match. The three things that were consistent with religious faith during the time of Christ, praying, fasting, and giving to charity, was what they were known for. These were people who memorized reams of tradition and scripture. Tradition was very important to the Pharisees. And when you looked at them, they were so incredibly intimidating that the average person who didn't give an entire lifetime to the study of the things that they studied held them in such high esteem that these were people who were walking around as the model of perfection. Jesus, though, didn't see them in that light. He saw them otherwise. In Matthew 23, verses 25 and 26, he was speaking to them, and he said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may be clean also, you get caught up wearing 
broadening your hem of your garment and wearing large phylacteries that contain religious scriptures and are symbols of your faith here in Israel. You are so caught up with being called rabbi, rabbi. You are so caught up but you are like a whitewashed tomb, beautiful on the outside, but on the inside filled with decay and all manner of corruption. When Jesus spoke of them, he spoke in very harsh terms. Matthew 15, 8, these people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You have the outer appearance. You have all the outer look. You look religious but your heart isn't mine. Conversion results from turning away from sins and turning to God. A person repents, and God forgives him of all of his sins. And repentance leads to conversion. And in repentance and conversion, there is a complete forgiveness of all of your sins all of your sins, not some of them, all of them. God makes it very, very clear. Verse 22, none of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. None. I can't tell you how many people who are believers still believe that they have to pay for their sins themselves. They just can't believe the grace of God is so great that he washes them and cleanses them from all sin. Repentance and conversion cancels all prior debts. You are completely washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been justified through faith in Christ. Listen, if you're a believer today, God is not holding your sins against you. You need to know that. What made me brand new? The knowledge of God's forgiveness, the acceptance of that, the acknowledgement that I am a sinner in need of God's grace, and then discovering, if I confess my sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. In Psalm 103, verses 11 through 13, as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as, as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, I always illustrate this this way, you have a globe, you start at the equator, proceed north, and as you continue, you reach the apex, and ultimately, once you cross over, you begin to go south. That's just the way it is. You start going north, you end up going south, then you end up going back north. But if you start at the same equator and you go to the east, you will never begin going to the west. It never happens. That's why God didn't say he separated our sins as far as the north is from the south. He said, I separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. That's just another picture of the fact that they are completely dealt with forever through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we ask the question in verse 23, do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? And not that he should turn from his ways and live? No, of course not. I want him to repent. I want every person to repent. You see this in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's God's desire that all should come to him. And he says, No, I don't take joy in this. I want people to be right with me. Verse 24 But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live. All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed because of them he shall die. 
Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. Hear now, O house of Israel. Is it not my way which is fair and your ways which are not fair? When a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity and dies in it, it is because of the iniquity which he has done that he dies. This man has a reputation for being righteous because on the external, he's been doing all the right things. All the right things. So he has a reputation for being righteous. But in reality, he turns away from God. You see, the true test of a man or a woman's righteousness is how he or she ends her life. It's not just the beginning, and it's not even in the middle of it. It's how they conclude it that demonstrates whether or not they were truly saved. I've known many people who appear righteous, but it was a fad or a phase of their life. There wasn't a genuine conversion at all. And you can have an outer appearance. You know, Paul, when he was speaking concerning righteousness and the righteousness that he at one time had according to the law of Moses, Paul made it very clear. It was found in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, uh, that concerning the righteousness which is in the law, Paul said, I'm blameless. Outwardly, he said, I observe the law. You could look at me, and I was very scrupulous for every single thing of the law. If you looked at me, I, I exceeded everyone in my own generation when it comes to being a zealous individual for having this righteousness. But then Jesus Christ arrested him, and when Jesus did that, Paul went on to say in verse uh, 7 of the same chapter, what things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. You see, a person can have every appearance of being righteous, but in reality, they don't have faith. Once again, you're saved by faith, not the external appearance of being a good person. So somebody can have this external appearance there in the nation of Israel where people say this is a righteous man, but the true test of his righteousness is his faith towards God because if his faith is towards God, he will continue in that faith over a lifetime. So this man has an appearance of righteousness, but in reality, he's a man who ultimately pursues evil. And in the pursuit of evil, he reveals his true heart as somebody who is not saved because somebody who is genuinely saved remains with the Lord. Of course, those who are genuinely saved can have seasons in which they're not walking as strongly as they have at other times. But those are seasons and not an entire way of life. The Bible makes it very clear that we demonstrate that we truly have a relationship with God by the manner of life that we live. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, John said, By this we know that we know Him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar. The truth's not in him. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. And by this we know that we are in him. It's that zeal, that desire to know his word and to obey it. And when you're a believer, you can have seasons, I'm not giving you permission to or encouraging you to this, by the way, but you can have seasons in which you're, you're just not being fruitful for the Lord. You know, a, a pig can return to the mud and a dog can return to the vomit. But the reason a pig returns to the mud and a dog returns to the vomit is because they're pigs and dogs. And that is natural for them to do. A son or daughter of God can go through a spell in their life where they return to the, the trash, the dirt that you were washed from when you got saved. And I've known more than one who's done it, and I've done it myself. Went back to the old life. The difference is this. 
is you cannot be happy there and you've got to get out of there as soon as possible. You have to. You have to. It was Cinco de Mayo, 1973. I still remember it, 23 years old. I got out of the military in December of 1972 and went into a backslide. Old army buddies, two of my buddies that I had been in the military with, and I took off, and from, I've said this to you before, from Newport Beach to the border of San Diego as we were entering into Mexico, between the three of us, we consumed two cases of beer just in that drive. Then we started hitting the bars in Ensenada, and we stayed in those bars pretty much for three days. When I got home, I was still totally hung over because we'd been drinking pretty solidly for three days. And I remember coming into my, my parents' house and sitting at the, the kitchen table there in their kitchen, the dinner table in their kitchen, and my sister Madeline, who was 19 at that time, whom I had led to Christ the day I got saved, sat across from me. And I remember as I was seated there at that table, she asked me, how did you enjoy your weekend? You see, on that weekend, like I told you, I, I, I drank pretty much the whole weekend. I found a track, a Christian track, a gospel track. And I was so drunk, yet I picked it up and I tried to get somebody to read it. And I still remember as my sister Madeline was asking me, did you have a good time? She didn't know. I said to her, yeah, we had a great time, and then just began to cry. 23 years old, just began to sob. I broke down at the table, and I said, Madeline, I'm absolutely miserable. I've walked away from the Lord. I said, and I am absolutely miserable. We went to church, and there was a young evangelist by the name of Mario Murillo. His name was Murillo, but he called himself Murillo. And um, he gave an invitation. If you need to get right with the Lord, you're a backslidden believer, and you need to get right with God today, stand to your feet right where you're at. And I stood up that day. And I told the Lord, I don't ever want to go back to that old way of life. You see, a dog returns to vomit and a pig returns to mud because by nature they are pigs and dogs. But a child of God can't remain there. You can't. There's something inside of you that is so grieved because the Holy Spirit is being grieved. You belong to Him. And you can't go back. That's why... That's why you want to keep the Word of God, because you love Him and you want to serve Him. An unrighteous man, an unrighteous woman, they can pursue evil to the day they die because they don't have a relationship with God. And so for them, they're just revealing where the nature truly is. They got tired of being good on the outside. They might as well live the way that they really feel. He says in verse 27, again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgression which he committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. God is merciful and he forgives. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord's not fair. O house of Israel, is it not my ways which are fair and your ways which are not fair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed. Get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. He says, repent. And he lets them know that the road to blessing is clearly marked and it comes to repentance. Cast away your sins. 
Receive the new heart. Receive the new spirit. It's like what the psalmist said, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. In the New Testament, God makes it very clear. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. You can run for years. You can run for miles away from God. But it only takes a moment and a step to return to Him. It's called repentance. God, forgive me, a sinner. And God says, I do, because I don't want to see you die, because I love you. And that's what God is telling Israel. Repent, receive a new heart, receive a new spirit, because I love you.